All right, guys, we made it to the end of our books. This is the last section in Inside Earth. We're going to talk about the rock cycle today. Now, the rock cycle takes everything else that we've learned in Chapter 5, and it puts it together. So, so far in Chapter 5, we've talked about three important kinds of rocks. We've talked about igneous rocks, metamorphic rocks, and sedimentary rocks. We've talked a little bit about how those different types of rocks form over time. Um, they each form in a slightly different way, and so scientists are going to classify them in slightly different ways. The rock cycle explains why. It explains why an igneous rock acts the way that it does, why a sedimentary rock has the characteristics that we see, and why an igneous rock um, forms with the types of textures that scientists note. And I know we've talked about it already in chapter five, but um, the, the rock cycle also explains a little bit about how rocks change over time. Just because a rock is an igneous rock right now doesn't mean that in thousands of years it's still going to look and be classified like an igneous rock. The earth is always moving, the earth is always changing. It doesn't seem like it when we're standing outside in our backyards, but we've learned over the course of Inside Earth that there are constructive and destructive forces that are always at play, and they're causing the rocks beneath our feet to change, they're causing them to move. Um, it's kind of exciting, it's the reason why people should enjoy studying rocks, right? Um, so the earth, or the rock cycle, excuse me, is a dynamic process and it's powered by those constructive and destructive forces that we learned about way back when we talked about plates, and we talked about earthquakes, and we talked about volcanoes. So today what I'm going to do, instead of a lesson like we usually would with the slides, I'm going to demonstrate the rock cycle. Now, I want you to pay close attention to how this demonstration works, because for your final project to demonstrate or to um, show what you've learned in chapter five, you're gonna have an opportunity to earn some extra credit by trying this demonstration at home and by attaching some pictures to your work. So in order to do this demonstration, first thing you're going to need are a couple of crayons. Doesn't matter what color, it doesn't matter if they're old, new, just any old crayons you can find. You'll need to take the paper off of them as well. Um, I would suggest using a um, pencil sharpener in this activity. Now, when I tried it with my pencil sharpener, it didn't work the way that I wanted to. So a backup plan is to have a pair of scissors handy. Um, you're also going to need some aluminum foil and it's good to have something kind of heavy and durable, like maybe if you can find a piece of wood um, for the end of the demonstration as well. But the first thing that you're going to need to do with your crayons is create some sediment. We're gonna start our rock cycle today by making sedimentary rock. Now, again, if you have a pencil sharpener, the easiest thing it's going to, or for you to do is going to be to sharpen the crayon and then to take all those little shavings and to use those as your sediment. Unfortunately for me, my crayons don't fit in my pencil sharpener, and so I improvised. And um, what I've decided to do instead is to use a pair of scissors. Now, scissors are sharp, right? So we have to be very careful. We have to use lab safety if we're gonna make sediment in this way. What you're gonna wanna do is open the scissors up. Don't put your finger underneath the blade. Keep your finger along the side of the blade. And then with the crayon securely on the table, remember we don't wanna hold things, um, while we are, are cutting them. With the crayon on the table, you're just going to slowly move the blade up and down the crayon. And as you do that, you'll notice that shavings start to appear. And you can shave down as many crayons, as many different colors as you want. One thing that's kind of interesting you'll notice, just because of the way that this process works, you end up with all different types of sediment. Notice that I have some fine grain sediment here already, some little tiny flecks. I also have some coarse grain sediment that you can see forming as well. All of this is um, the, the sediment that forms the sedimentary rock. The process of wearing away at a rock to produce sediment, remember, is called erosion. And then as that sediment lands in a new surface, on a new surface, um, we call that deposition. Now those are the first two processes in making a sedimentary rock, correct? The third process is called compaction. So I'm gonna add the sediment that I just created to my pile of sediment that I made a little bit earlier. Here we have all of our different minerals all combined together in new sediment chunks. The final process, as you know, is compaction. And so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna take my piece of aluminum foil and I'm gonna turn it over on itself. Now this represents all of the years of sediment piling one layer on top of another, on top of another. And because I don't have enough um, 
aluminum foil in order to add the right amount of pressure. I'm gonna add a little bit of pressure just by pressing down with my hands. Now, normally, when we're making a sedimentary rock, in addition to this process of pressure and cementation, there's oftentimes a binding agent, like um, crystals that have been dissolved in water um, that are gonna help to solidify all of those little pieces of sediment together. But over time, that compaction will be done, and what you'll start to notice is the formation of a rock. So here we have a piece of sedimentary rock. If you wanted to um, earn the extra credit for your activity or your, your chapter five um, project, you could take a picture of, of your sedimentary rock and you could attach this to the sedimentary rock section. So now I have made a sedimentary rock. Okay, the first of our, our three. Um, I don't have to go through the rock cycle in any particular order. I'm just sort of picking randomly at this point. How about we go from a sedimentary rock to an igneous rock. Well, what do we need in order for an igneous rock to form? Molten material. Hopefully you are thinking to yourself, molten material. So in order to get molten material from our sedimentary rock, we're going to have to heat things up a little bit. For the demonstration today, I have a hot plate. You probably don't have one of these at home, um, but if you have a stove top, that would work just fine for this. You could even, if you're not using aluminum foil, perhaps um, if you have this in like a ceramic bowl, you might be able to use your microwave. Personally, I would suggest using a stove to heat things up. What I'm gonna do is form my aluminum foil into a little bowl, just so that Things don't start to melt and roll off the sides here into my hot plate. And then I'm going to take my sedimentary rock and I'm going to expose it to some heat. Now the heat to melt rock usually comes from the center of the earth. It's generated by the earth itself. The deeper into the earth that a rock goes, the hotter it's going to get and the more it's going to melt. So I turned my hot plate on a little bit earlier just to allow it to warm up. Um, we'll get a chance here to watch as these crayon pieces, these pieces of sediment are exposed to some fairly intense heat. I'm gonna turn this up a little bit more. You'll notice already that those rocks are starting to melt. And just like with the earth, the rocks that are nearest to the heat source, nearest to the bottom of the earth, are going to melt first. Notice as these rocks melt, they form a solution. So no longer do we have distinctly pink pieces and distinctly purple pieces. We see all of those minerals starting to mix together. We are actually forming some new compounds. We see that in um, uh, igneous rock as well, right? Some of those minerals are going to mix together. Now, here we have some steaming hot molten material. I'm gonna take this off of my hot plate and I'm gonna move it down onto the cool surface so that I can start to cool off and solidify into our very first igneous rock. Now, you'll notice that some of this molten material didn't heat up as quickly, right? It's, it's not completely um, solidified yet. This sort of mirrors what happens inside the earth too. Remember that not all materials are going to be um, heated in the same way, just depending on the, the chemicals inside the minerals that make them up and their location in relation to the center of the earth or um, a batholisk or a dike or some other um, offshoot of molten material that's making its way towards our surface. And so you'll notice that um, the composition of our rock isn't completely uniform, pretty standard. The reason, um, or the texture of this igneous rock looks to me like it's going to be pretty fine-grained. And we can um, identify that it's going to be fine-grained because of how quickly it's cooling. Rocks like granite, igneous rocks that form beneath the surface of the earth and have a chance to cool slowly, will have larger um, crystals to them. They'll be coarse-grained because they had a longer time to cool. This, I would say, is closer to the mineral obsidian which is like glass, it cools super duper fast. So if we let this cool all the way out, we would have our, igne or our, our igneous rock. Um, remember that igneous rocks form from the cooling of molten material. 
The only rock that we haven't created yet is a metamorphic rock. And remember that metamorphic rocks change radically because they're exposed to both heat and pressure. I'm gonna take advantage of the fact that my igneous rock, my molten material, is still pretty warm. And I'm gonna use this as a chance to turn it into a metamorphic rock. In order to do that, I'm going to add a little bit of pressure to my heat. I'm gonna take a little bit more aluminum foil. I will bend the ends of my aluminum foil in on itself and then put on one more piece just to be safe and add some pressure. This is equivalent to the pressure that is placed on a rock as it's buried underneath mounds and mounds of other rocks. Heat and pressure over time will change the composition of a rock, it'll change the, the texture of the rock, the hardness of the rock, even some of the chemicals that make the rock up. Now after heat and pressure have done their thing, you'll notice that our crayons look a little bit different than they did before. And if we let this cool even longer, you would see even better that we have a brand new structure here that looks quite a bit different from the structure that we started with. If you're doing the extra credit for our chapter five project, you'll want to take a picture of your metamorphic rock too and make sure that you submit that. Now the rock cycle isn't done just because we've hit our metamorphic rock. You could just as well, if you wanted to continue the fun, shave down your metamorphic rock into sediment and make a sedimentary rock all over again. You could heat this up again and let it cool and you would have an igneous rock. The rock cycle is a beautiful thing because it works in all different ways. Um, if you have more questions about rock cycle or about your chapter five test or project coming up, um, feel free to stop by our hangout this morning or email me with questions.